Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today. All right, we are back in full effect in the Detroit is Different podcast studios, and I'm continuing with this Fight for Justice series that is special and is definitely very uh, instrumental that I have already had uh, a collection of three strong black men speaking on what's happening right now in our nation that has existed for a long time. And I'm bringing back one of my favorite guests and one of my most uh, dynamic discussions, Jonathan Quarles. How are you today? I'm well, I'm well. It's a pleasure to be here always, definitely. Well, I called you and I definitely like looking at what's going on on tr through traditional media. And we're all definitely also watching what's happening in social media. And some of these takes, I think, should be concentrated and offered through the form of Detroit is different. And that's why I'm happy that you're here joining me. Um, so I really want to start with a lot of your opinion of what's happening. What are you seeing? And, and more so, I guess, than your opinion, because I guess it's mental it's physical and it's emotional. So it, it's like layers to how we're all responding to this. Most um, definitely. I thought you'd be a great person to provide perspective with all of your history, working from a lens in the, I guess, local government perspective mm -hmm. and now in the private sector. But what can we do to, to fight in this balance and, uh, and engage the system to bring about justice or should we be looking straight up for our own independence and black empowerment in our own way? Like how much of mm -hmm. it is working hand in hand? But before we get to that discussion, yeah. I really just want to start on like, what's your feelings? What's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, what's happening? It's um, I think like a lot of people, this is very emotional. Um, you know, I, I tell people I was on a call earlier today and I was telling a friend of mine how I've I've had people who I've met over 10 years ago internationally um, who have no ex no idea of really of the American experience in particular a black American experience that have called me and you know apologized for something that they just felt like there's nothing that they can do they're like what can we do to help like I feel so bad for you you are a black man I can imagine you living in the environment that you're living in now and still keeping your head about you um, I I've been very it's been it's it's a very interesting time. I think I, I tell people all the time, I think this is the defining moment of our history. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be so critical that we don't all that we continuously remain um, emotional, but not just leave it there. Because the reality is, if we only become emotion, emotional, that's going to go away at some point. This is the time where we're going to have to redefine what the future is going to be. So even when we're talking about solutions, because I'm all about solutions, like it's one thing to talk about things, one thing to protest. And I think it's very necessary. All of the protesting. I think that is that is very critical. But what next? Mm -hmm. What next? And so, you know, we can talk about that from a political standpoint, uh, mm -hmm. policy standpoint and even economically. And to your point. It's interesting that you asked the question, do we create our own or do we work within the systems that's already created? Yes. I can go in on both ways. Um, and it's an argument in both ways, yeah. as that has been the crisis of the black American and the black experience uh, since, you know, enslavement, reconstruction, yep. Jim Crow. And as we see, even right now, yep. uh, that. That argument, when you think of the argument raised by uh, most uh, black intellectuals throughout history, always bring up the differences into what the progression of black empowerment looks like. Is it the route of Booker T. Washington? Is it the route of Marcus Messiah Garvey? Hmm. Or is it the route of W.B. Du Bois? And these discussions have been happening since that era, you know since that that Niagara conference and yep. the movements that were going on in Harlem at that time that you know are highlighted as history highlights Harlem but it was happening throughout America everywhere yep. even in the deep south yep. it's just that those three figures stand out as pivotal figures in those movements so um 
as you said, you're, you're interacting with so many people from an international lens. And when we think about international lens, uh, injustice uh, being seen internationally has also been one of the things that has brought about change for black Americans. Uh, we think of as now in this interview, I'm, I'm bringing up the work of Ida B. Wells traveling to Europe mm -hmm. to end the lynchings of then. And now you know, as people are saying, this is a modern day lynching. Yep. Uh, what happened to George Floyd? What happened to Breonna Taylor? Mm -hmm. What happened to Trayvon Martin? What's happened to me and you just driving down the street? Like mm -hmm. these are definitely times where it, it's jogging the minds of many of our people. Yep. So um, First, let's talk a little bit about that historic precedent, as you know, how systems and government and politics work. Yeah. Ida B. Wells and her work, because I know you're, you're a fan of history. Oh, yeah. How did how did the international pressures influence American change? Yeah. So I, I think that international influ influences everything. Um, but I, I think to your point and, you know, one of the things that I. I'm a big fan of, of those three gentlemen that you mentioned, Booker T. Washington, W.D. Du Bois and, uh, and Marcus Messiah Gar Garvey. But I'm really a big fan of Marcus Messiah Garvey. And I do think that, you know, and I've been saying this for a while, is that we have to have our own. We have to control our own. And, you know, you know, there's some points that I want to talk about around that. Yes. One, you know, we talk about policy. We talk about elections. And, you know, you know, you have majority of African-Americans that are Democrats. And a very few that are Republicans. I think now when you talk about having our own, not only should we be growing our own as far as food, uh, creating our own jobs amongst each other. Um, but more importantly, we need to be looking at it. What Dr. Claude Anderson talked about is that collective economics and collective group politics. Right. We need to be sitting down with with both Republicans and Democrats and having conversations about our agenda. We need to be focused. We need to be disciplined on one or two things that we want. And we need to be holding people accountable. We have to have our votes to be earned, not uh, something that is just um, either neglected or taken for granted. Um, and I think so often we've done that. And that's why we had we have not ha never we haven't had either party to really represent who we are. And so we've got to be able to sit down with and work both sides of the aisle, because at the end of the day, if it's not good for our for our community, it's not good for anything. And so we should not be supporting anything that's not of our best interest, because that's what every other community is doing. But us. So that's one thing. Second thing is, like I told you, we got to be disciplined and focused. Right. It's not enough just to be emotional. I tell people all the time I've been black all my life. You know, I'm 38 years old and I've been you know, I, I've experienced police brutality growing up in Flint. Mm -hmm. This is not new for me. It's not a surprise. Uh, you know, I, I'm still surprised when I get, you know, a lot of my white friends who call me and just like, oh, my God, I can't believe this pl police brutality is actually a real thing in, t in 2020. It's like, no, this has been a real thing for like way before I was alive. Um, but we got to be disciplined and we got to be focused because this is a long game. Mm -hmm. If we think that this thing is going to change in the next few months, because right now we get a lot of momentum and a lot of traction. The most critical thing right now and what I'm loving to see is I'm seeing a lot of young white people protesting all over the world. Now, people see that as, oh, that's awesome. But I'm like, this is the time where we need to be sitting down and strategizing and having a plan and working deals right now behind the scenes while we have other folks out on the streets working right now. Um, we also need to have we also need to understand what political activism really is. It's not enough just to go out and vote and to and, and to shout your voice out and say, I want to be heard. But we got to get involved in a political process. And that's why this system was created. The system in America was created so that you can there's two ways that you can actually create power. And that's one through money and that's through vote and your vote and mobilizing voices and, vo and vote. We don't do a good job of of the money thing. We'll go out and vote. But when you ask somebody to write a check for an elected official or a judge or a county commissioner or, you know, or, or a mayor, most of us don't give like we should and we have to be able to we have to leverage all of that and that's the only way we're going to be taken seriously if we're not if we're coming to the table and say before we write a check to you you got to do xyz for us and if you're not doing that you're not getting my vote and you're not getting my money but we have to do it collectively it's not enough for just a small group of people to do it we have to be we have to have a large collective voice and a collective agenda now keep in mind we're not gonna have everybody it's 13 percent of i think 13 percent of america is african-american but if we have a coordinated vote with money behind it, as well as an agenda, 
and we're focused on that one or two things. We don't need to have a list of things that we want. We need to have one or two things that we're going to focus on that's realistic, that's doable. And if you don't have an agenda and if you don't have a plan to address that, we're not voting for you. And we voting in blocks. That's what Dr. Claude Anderson talk about, voting in blocks. We're not voting. This is not just the Jonathan going to the polls. Mm -hmm. It's my whole community, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people saying we're not we're not going to vote unless you actually, uh, you know, uh, have an agenda for us. And the last thing is coalition building. I think now more than ever, we've got to be able to look at the generational uh, what I call the seasoned leadership uh, of the civil rights movement. And we have to start working side by side with the millennials, with the Gen Z's. We have to do that. It can't be one or the other. Mm -hmm. For a while, I know when I was coming up, it was like, well, if they don't give it to us, we're going to take it. We, we need the institutional. We, I, I think everybody's relevant and we have to be able to bridge that. And then we also need to bridge coalition with other communities that, that shares the same struggle as we do in their own right. There's other communities that are having a lot of issues um, that are just outside of African-American community. But we have, the only way that we can do that is that we have those coalition uh, building with those communities and we be strategic and, and, and work our plan. So as you speak about that, it's, it's a lot of uh, things that I want to get your perspective on mm -hmm. because these discussions have happened usually uh, in families, uh, in friends. Uh, this, this discussion in black America has been happening for so long. Yeah. You know, the, the outrage with Trayvon Martin, uh, Colin Kaepernick's protest and what that represented. Philando Castile was like such a heart wrenching video for most of us. Oh yeah. And I believe that that's black America having that discussion. And I guess what you call it, the American heartland, the, the great America, again, <laughs> was saying a context because policing is different to them. It's like yep. you have a context for being stopped by the police. The assumption of criminality, as we're already seeing the assassination of the character of George Floyd mm -hmm. take place. The assassination of the character of Breonna Taylor take place. The Ahmaud Aubrey character assassination mm -hmm. that took place like, hey, let's show another video of him being stopped by the police for no reason. Yep. But look at him yep. not wearing a shirt. You know, like like these these questions all in the in the, in the shadows of what's happening now. I, I do agree. It's it's more attention being being placed as like damn i guess that does happen maybe this isn't just a farce as the criminal element has definitely been pushed on black men mm -hmm. as we see our prisons are filled with yep. black men yep. we have the most filled prisons in them in the world mm -hmm. you know we have more i want to say 50 percent of the world's prisoners are americans mm -hmm. and of those 50 percent 60 percent what what is it 45 percent of black men you know, so the criminality of a black man is heightened yep. in our society, um, which makes me say, like, when we engage in the political process or even the money process, as we've seen, things change. The standards change. The, the goalposts moves. Yep. So when the, the political block, yep. um, it all shifts. Yep as we engage yep. so so how do we create the accountability for who these figures are or for what those proposals and policies are to make sure that they're enacted and we can hold this stuff accountable yep yeah and that's the whole part of the political uh, act activism place um i think we got to start running our own candidates hmm. we got to start running our own candidates um, we cannot take whatever is given to us and say we have to pick the uh, one out of the, uh, the out of the, the two evils. Like, I hate that concept because it's like at the end of the day. Two evils is still evil. Yeah. You, you pick the less out of evil. It's still evil. Yeah. And so we got to stop. We got to change that mindset. And it, and again, right now, we know that there is a mayoral campaign coming uh mayoral election coming up next year in Detroit, in Detroit. Yes. Uh, so right now, like there's a group of, of individuals and I'm a part of it is that actually looking at what is it that we're going to be asking for? Because you got to come through us. We got to make sure that we know who's going to be running. Um, and more importantly, is there who do we want to run? Um, who represents what we want 
and and, and we got to have an agenda. That's what I'm saying. We have to be focused. We got to have a dis. We got to be disciplined, and we got to have a plan. And I think historically we just haven't. We always trusted other organizations, and I'm not knocking any organizations, but some organizations shouldn't be around anymore. Well, some organizations, when we think uh, one of the most landmark organizations is the NAACP, uh, that started by W. B. Du Bois, uh, and, and more of this history comes from. Uh, the, the Niagara Conference, and from that, uh, it was some some Jewish allies that said, "Okay, let's step up and mm-hmm. let's let's look at what W. E. Dubois, W. E. B. Dubois, and Ida B. Wells have to say." Ida B. Wells was like, "Okay, I'm not with this co-opting of what we want," mm-hmm. so she walked away. Yep. W. E. B. Dubois at the time stayed, mm-hmm. but like a lot of people don't know, as he even transitioned and grew politically. He walked away from that organization as time grew yep. and spent his closing days in life in Africa yep. uh, with Kwame Ture and many people. Sure. Uh, which that it can be a story within its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the foundation of this National Association for the Advancement of Color People has often served as a in the Urban League. Um those are two but it's many other organizations that have served almost as as assets in our community and oftentimes as they say a seat at the table Mm -hmm. you know and put people in seats at the table so so how do we even wrestle with that knowing that you know the the duality of, of of that is who we're looking to reach out to like when something does happen, when you can't when you can't vote as a black person, what do you do? The first organization you're thinking to call is the NAACP. Yeah. You know, yep. uh, I specifically remember it was it was um, it was the gubernatorial election for uh, where where Governor Snyder was running against Verg Bonero. Mm. And I went to my polling location and they did not have me listed on the voter rolls. And the very first number I called was uh, Maya Anthony, the daughter of Wendell Anthony, who I knew was working the polling center at Detroit NAACP. And I'm like, damn, I didn't even think it's it's back to one of those things. Like I'm in Detroit. I'm one of the few people that vote in my district. You know, I've been at this church for forever, even when they move it to the they move from the elementary school to the church all the time. Yeah, I'm not here. I'm not listed. And then they said they can give me um, at the time. This was like some like uh, banana republic shit. They said they can give me a supplemental ballot, (laughs) meaning that if it's a contentious vote, now my ballot will be looked at because I was like, what does that even mean? Mm. So it's like I I wrote my election and I'm like, what can I do? Uh, The NAACP said, well, you can go down to the uh, to the Department of Elections went down to the Department of Elections. It was a long line. They said, you should be there at the polling location. At this point, it's past the absentee time, so you need to go back to the polling location. So I was caught between both, and I just said, I guess I'm not voting today. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's not, uh, I mean, that's typical. I mean, going through all of that, people just want to be able to, I think we definitely, and I I do think that our Secretary of State, um, Jocelyn Benson, is doing a good job of making sure that the ability to vote is as seamless and simple as possible, Mm -hmm. because that's what you want to do. I mean, I think it should be a national day for voting. I think everyone should have the day off for voting. Mm -hmm. And I know there's people in other states that's talking about doing that, but that's critical. I mean, voting is so important, but I mean, I, I do know that there are certain people politically that don't want to have that because they don't. That's this is a way to suppress the black vote. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there should be no school. There should be no um, there should there should be a national holiday for voting because mm-hmm. it's so critical. But I mean, beyond voting, like we have to be educated what we voting on. There's people that just vote straight down the ticket and yes. not knowing what's really going on. And, and a um, lot of those people are as black people. We have a disposition to do two things. We're voting Democrat. Right. Or we're not voting. Right. Though it's kind of like apathy or a Democrat. That yep. that is the black option. Because yep. to vote Republican, it's like it, that's not even an option. Yep. But technically not voting is empowering more of the Republican vote. So I believe that suppressing the black vote towards mm-hmm. apathy is a tactic used yep. by Yep. I, I think that we have a I think we have a really good opportunity like i said once we 
demand that our yes. vote our votes are being uh, to be earned i think we have an opportunity right now and you know there's a senate race right now where there's an african-american uh john james running for u.s senate yeah. uh and historically obviously most democrats have, uh most most black people vote democrat but i tell you one thing I, I i've seen a shift in even uh senator gary peters um this term than ever before uh john james is a real candidate he's yeah. a real candidate and he's black and, and i think i think uh he he works out at the same gym we work out at. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. So it's like we not only do have we seen his commercials, but it's like that dude, you know, we've so, seen him and in all due machine. All due respect, I think uh Senator Gary Peters, I, I actually like him as a person. I think he has um he's a good person. I do think he's a good person. Yeah. Um, but that's not enough for me for my vote. And, you know, my thing is what have you done for my community? Like show me I need I'm you know, show me. I need to see receipts. And, you know, I look back over the years, all these years he's been an elected official um, and I haven't really seen a lot of engagement besides going to the NAACP, you know, those the the dinners, you know, things like that. But what have you done tangibly? How much money have you brought back to our community? What kind of causes have you fought for our community? And the idea of you being a good person alone is not good enough. Like you have to show me. And so I've seen I've actually noticed how this time now that John is actually has is starting to resonate. Uh, you know, he's already was doing good in the Republican Party. But now he got some some uh, business black business folks who actually understand and is listening to him and starting to really say, wow, this guy is not as bad as we thought he was. He's a black Republican, but he actually speaks our language. I see now of the Senator Gary Peters actually doing more things to engage black folks. Um, and I think that's good. I think that's healthy. And I think when we actually look at it from a standpoint of our vote is not for sale. Our, our vote is not for sale. Um, and I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, you got to come like with it. And if you don't come with it, then we're going to see what the other viable options are. And I think that when we do that, we're going to have both the Republicans and the Democrats More fighting for engaged. Front. Yeah, because that's what it is. And and as you speak about that, like I think Gary Peters, I definitely can't tell you politically. I, I, I've seen him give some uh, some speaking points mm -hmm. uh, before. I, I remember uh, definitely George during the George W time, he was mm -hmm. adamantly against the. Uh, I seen, I, I saw him speak adamantly against the sure. Iraqi op occupation, yep. uh, which I was against that as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, and other than that, right now at this point, all I can say, and most black people, I think don't know this, especially in this district, but Marcella, I, it's like, I, I know her and it's like, I, uh, I attribute for him to hire her yeah. and I know her drive yep. and her, intuitiveness of mac yep then that's that's empowered now yep. how much is he empowering her to get back to that community mm -hmm. how much is he engaging her and relying on her to to actually uh distribute resources i i i yeah. haven't witnessed that i yeah. i I'm, I'm unsure myself i, I, I and I, I i love her i love her dearly she uh she sent me a note and she was like Oh, so she was like, who are you supporting? Um, I, I love her dearly, but I mean, she does. She's not in a place where she can make those kind of decisions. She works but, for him and she's a good representation of him. He actually has a good team. Uh, Corey she needs to be empowered. She needs to be empowered with the work that she's been doing. I agree. And that's whether she's working for uh, a black, a black elected official or a white, or white. elected exactly. official because she's actually enacted so much community change with and, no budget and, on and, her own and credibility. Yes. I mean, she she gives credibility to to that office. Her like and, said, and Corey. In, my, in the back of my mind, that's what I think. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't I mean. Yeah. And this is and these are the, the layered discussions. And also on the John James side, as we both probably know, Wayne, Wayne Bradley Jr. Shout, shout out Wayne, <laughs> Wayne boy, oh boy. He has one of the most hilarious Facebook pages ever uh, <laughs> as one of the most staunch as, as, as Trump supporters as a black man, which I find it very evasive, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of what he puts up and what he doesn't put up, mm -hmm. you know, and I think he likes um, I think he likes stirring the pot, as they may say. But John James's alliance with President Trump makes me call into question so much of any of his character because to align yourself with Donald Trump after seeing so many of the actions that he he's taken and his ego, it means like, okay, are you aligning yourself with him? Because it's like, okay, I got to just, I have to submit to him just to get whatever I got to get to the table. Or are you really aligning yourself with him? Like, is this, is this, 
is this submission be to his power or is this submission uh as a as a scheme yourself but either way i don't know uh and no i don't know it, it doesn't mm. feel right it feels icky it feels bad it feels nasty I, you know, I think that's what a lot of people say. Uh, and, I, and I really I think that John would be a good person to come on uh, mm -hmm. to talk because a lot of people and I know John very like personally. Um, you know, I remember when he first ran and some of the stuff that he said, I was just like, that's not the John I know. Um, you know, it's politics is a very interesting thing, especially if you're not if you weren't raised or you're not, you know, you weren't groomed to be a politician. Um what I what I can say about John is that John is I mean, if there's ever any proven leadership and that whole when I talk about the whole bipartisanship, like he's not going to be uh, I don't think that he would be someone that's like, I'm only going to do what Republicans want. He's like, what is going to be in the best interest of? And this is how I look at it. From, when we say strategic, I think that is we lose when we don't have we have two senators in Michigan and we lose when we don't have a Democrat and a Republican. So when we have a president to have eight years, you know, right now we have four, but we may have potentially Trump may get reelected if he get reelected. So that means eight years we've lost because we're not at the table because we're not of that party. Like Stabenow or, or Peters cannot sit down and have a meaningful conversation to bring and deliver anything back to the state because Trump's not going to have that conversation with him. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that goes the same way if we have a Democrat party, we have two Republicans. So I think it's so important that we we want have people that actually is going to be on our issues and then have someone it'd be good to have a republican and a democrat that actually are and i think i love debbie Stabin. i've known her for years and she's she's been amazing for michigan but i do think that like i said when we talk about the way we look at politics got to be different than you know um you know what we see in the media because a lot of stuff that that has been said about john james has been uh uh, I feel like this has been misquoted. It's been taken out of context. Mm -hmm. And when it's clarified, it's never like published. And yeah. so, um, but yeah, I mean, the whole idea, I, I think that he'd be a good guest or for you to, you two to talk. And I would love, and I would love that. And I would welcome that. Yeah. Because that is going to be the number one question. And I already know. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of Detroiters, different people that just wouldn't watch the interview. Yeah. But I, I welcome it. But I they have to. You have to. You got to call. That's why I say, like, you got to put you. I don't care if you black or white. Like, you have mm -hmm. to be called to the table. When you say something that's inappropriate to our community, you got to be you got to be held accountable. You and, can't like you don't get a pass. And that is one of the challenges I have right now for a lot of my black community leaders mm -hmm. and also black Democrats right now. As I feel that um, like this week, there was a there was a public forum mm -hmm. with some of the biggest CEOs around Detroit. Yeah. And and uh, called. I, I'm not sure if this was I know Wendell Anthony was a big part of this. I don't know if this was an NAACP event or was this a uh, something that Wendell Anthony was doing on his own connected mm -hmm. to the Fannie Lou Hamer Association or maybe just. Wendell Anthony himself, but I know he was there and other figures were there. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it is dismissing these CEOs like Chris Illich to speak to it himself. You, you need to speak to this yourself. You need to stand by yourself because if now if I question what Chris Illich said, now I'm ending up with a back and forth with, what, with, with my brother instead of... right with what this man said right it's like i'm pulling the rug under yeah you know from mm. from my people yep um so can we talk a little bit about that backroom deal as many people talk about the backroom deal whereas i'm big for transparency and i know it's very hard for transparency to move agendas forward because you're welcoming in any person yeah. with whatever's going on yep. to change the topic and change the subject yep. and everything yep. but uh when the negotiate when any negotiations for the people happens without the people. Yep. How needed is that? Can 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 that happen? Mm -hmm. And what what role do we can can we play when those things happen politically? No, nah, I mean that's critical, and that's the thing. Again, it goes back to like we have to hold each other accountable. And it's nothing personal, but this is for the betterment of our people, for our community. So for anyone that takes it personal for, for, you know, those back deals, that's it has to be for the people. And I think that we now I think Detroit, I, I'm loving what I'm seeing in Detroit now. I think for a while, you know, a little after, you know, Kilpatrick administration left, I think most people f lost faith in, in black leadership in Detroit. And I think now it's to a point where people are seeing that, OK, 
we're not we haven't gotten any better as a, as a community since then so okay what are we doing and i think we have to we we're gonna have to really be honest with ourselves and we're gonna have to really be um thoughtful about who who's the who's gonna be in the next leadership i do think that we have a next generation that i'm i'm really happy and proud of but again i think you can't have that next leadership without the institution to be able to help guide and direct with no self-interest in place i i i, I find that sometimes and i don't want to say i don't want to overgeneralize but a lot of the um civil rights uh generation um, a lot of times it's like, uh, how do I help, help self-preserve uh, mm -hmm. myself opposed to the community? And I think some of it is out of touch of what the community really is today. Um, and we have to hold all our leaders accountable. Um, and I think there's a way that we do it that, so that it doesn't show dissension amongst ourselves. Um, I think that's really big because we can't be divided. We have to be together. Um, and for those leaders that are not leading us and the people, we got we to gotta, we gotta get rid of them. Now, when you speak to that, um, it's a lot of takes I have on that. Mm -hmm. um, and before I even move there, let's look at some actual policy for black people. One of the toughest things about this is uh, it's hard. It, I, re I don't see any policy for black people. It was great to see what the, the mayor of Washington, D.C. did the other day yep. uh, to paint the street with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. But usually when we're talking about black policy, it's minorities people of color um felons uh people with uh with um you know with low income it's 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 talking around concepts of systemic issues that are symptoms of systemic racism mm -hmm. but nothing is explicitly just for that black person that's like hey that guy is a manager at autozone she's a manager at kroger that that you know they're both nurses and they you know and they're not in the they're they're earning more as a family than fifty thousand dollars a year sure nothing just explicitly black yeah you know yeah um how can politically can something like that exist and then this is my locked in mind uh-huh i'm even asking you this question because i've already limited myself to think that eh, well probably politically it can't exist but I'm asking you, can something explicitly say this is for black people? This is for descendants of enslaved people. Yep. Yeah. So I, I do think that that's something I agree with you. I mean, there there, there is and there, there, there has to be something. Um, but I mean, the only way that we can get that is that we got to get involved and engage yeah. in the process. I hear so many times that I'm not political. I don't like that politics stuff. But they, yes. but what you don't understand is that politics is in everything, whether it's business, whether it's you going out to a club, it's politicians dictate a lot of stuff and if we're not at this if we're not at the table we're on the menu and so we have to get involved not just in going out and vote right we got to know what we're voting for and we got to be mobilized we got to be one voice but then more importantly we really have to we got to put our money where our mouths are i mean we like our spending power we actually have real spending power yeah you know like we one of the things that that most what i find at businesses are are in need of our access to capital and through Most politics, definitely. you can get that stuff. I mean, we just yeah. spent I can't remember how many trillions we spent in in during this COVID-19 where the, the government was just like printing paper, you know, just printing money every day yeah, to circulate amongst our economy. And they say they can't afford to give us reparations. Yes. And that's that definitely is another point that I, I will drive to. Yeah. And, and in reference to that. I mean, one of the number one disparities that we have in our explicitly black community is. The crisis of healthcare. Right now, some of this healthcare crisis is is real, meaning that the Tuskegee experiments wasn't that long ago. Mm -hmm. There's a strong susceptibility of many Black people saying, I, I, "I'm not. I'm staying away from the doctor because I don't trust the doctor. Yep. I don't trust the hospital." Yep. Uh, we have not had uh, historically as many almost every institution. We have reason and caution to not engage with it, mm -hmm. but hospitals are one of those in the med medical industry is one of those systems. But connected to this COVID-19, when we look at so many uh, of what has been labeled as black death connected to this. Yeah, yeah. or these vaccines that's getting ready to come out. And that's the other question that I was going to say. And it's, you know, I mean, it's going to be hard pressed. I mean, as strange as this is, I, like maybe, what was it, maybe what, two, three weeks before everything was shutting down? Mm -hmm. uh, we were in the locker room, me, you and my dad yeah. having a discussion about this. Yep. Specifically, all of us were saying, 
we definitely gonna have to see a lot of other people take a vaccine before yeah we consider it yeah 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 I'm, I'm not a big proponent on vaccines i mean in the studies that i found i mean even with my kids i don't you know there's very there's a lot of vaccines that i just don't allow my kids to take because there's just there's never there's not any real scientific proof to show that this actually reduces i mean there's even va the vaccines that they're talking about and testing now they've tried them out on and they have they can't prove that it actually won't allow for COVID to not come back again as as right now that is one of the realities yeah so like what you're talking when you say politically politically something can be done we have a sitting mayor that uh that at one point in time ran the biggest hospital and now mm -hmm. we have the deputy mayor who was just in that position mm -hmm. in, in conrad mallet jr yeah uh of running this hospital system yeah and we still have these despairing situations mm -hmm. that are desperate for many of the detroit citizens yep. which is still the most populated city of black people right you know politically that's political yep you know so politically within policies can mm -hmm. you speak a little bit about uh, about the consideration that these hospitals are given from local municipalities to conduct business? And then do we keep checks and balances on like as we allow you this, then you have to allow our citizens that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's one of the things like I said, we're holding city council and that's what the whole balance with city council and the mayor's office. I mean, you have to be able to hold them accountable. But most people don't. Most people don't know what's going on. And most people think that, OK, well, they say we can get free testing and we can get these vaccines. Let's just get it. But not knowing what the implications are um, and who are, who's actually who's you know, who's actually the ones getting the vaccines. Right. Because, you know, I think we were bragging about, yeah, we're going to be the first ones to get the vaccines and the first ones to do the testing and things like that. Um, but again, I think about the Tuskegee experiment. And, and we rightfully so think of that. Yeah. Is there is there a way? Can you speak a little bit about uh, from your history and past of knowing what's the relationship between a municipality like Detroit? Mm -hmm. And we have such a, a, a massive. Yep. Uh, the DMC is, is is one of the strongest business districts. Yep. In Detroit, I mean, I think a lot of people look at Dan Gilbert, but the DMC is a hell of an entity. Right, right, right. Um, so, what's the relationship between the local government and hospitals in the city? So, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not familiar. Well versed. Yeah, I'm not well versed on that. Um, but again, like it's not even just a local thing, but the governor has the governor has the power to do certain things and to mandate certain things. Hmm. Um, you know, throughout the school. So before they go back to school, there can. The governor can say we're going to have vaccines that you can't get. You can't go to you can't go back to school, children, until you get this vaccine. Yeah. I mean, that's a real thing. And so that's yeah. something that, you you know, I know I'm paying attention to not, yeah. not just for my kids, but just also just understanding like what's going to be family and your friends. And yeah. All the other students, you know, because that's something to take into consideration. Yep. Uh, when, when we think black policy. Yep. Um, I don't even know what what is that precedent, because that's what. I'm really looking for. I'm looking for explicitly black, yeah. not black by association, right? Or black through believing it's black. Yep. And I don't even know if there is actually a lot of like you, uh, precedent in that for something like that. Yeah. So, so I right think you bring a good point. Yeah. I think for that's unprecedented things to happen. No question. As we're seeing injustice happen. Yep. On a, a you know, like any and all. Uh, disparities in quality of life yep. are exponentially higher in explicitly black institutions. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, in the 19, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who mm. is one of the uh, one of the most, as people will say, one of the most racist presidents ever, but he did ca call in the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. And uh, he, he historically told Martin Luther King, you're going to have to make me do this. Meaning like his stance was you're going to have to get enough political support, everything you're saying, to force me to make actions. You know, he also gave the famous quote, you know, nothing makes, you know, uh, the poorest white man is, is happier. I'm, I'm probably misquoting this, but the poorest white man in America is happy as long as he knows he's better than any black man right. in America. Right. You know, and his tongue in cheek nature uh, mm -hmm. of being that Southern Texas boy. Yep. Uh left a lot of strong political quotes you yep, know yep. but uh but in that having that statement he also was the one to sign into law the civil rights act which because it's civil rights going back to claude anderson right. instead of something explicitly for black people mm -hmm. it's so many different manipulations of what happens yep. and in a lot of ways the quality of black life has 
deteriorated oh yeah economically yeah. in many facets and it's actually then. yeah i mean it's 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 have moved closer to the bottom i mean now you have all of the what, what, what uh is it chris rock said or is it the david chappelle it's about the abc people yeah <laughs> um yeah. i mean seriously i mean that's you know women rights um lgbs i, I can't LGBTQ remember lgbtq rights yeah. that's uh, that's become a more of a priority than than the black stuff yes. like civil rights and so like i said the way that it was written is now making to a point where i think black people are at the lowest of the totem hole if that yeah. If that, especially a black man. Uh, so like minority mm -hmm. is usually what's put there. Right. And minority could be a white woman. Right. Married to the richest white man in the world, you know. And as we saw, even with the whole concept of small business, mm -hmm. we, we were all revealed that the L.A. Lakers are a small business. Shake Shack is a small business. Yeah. Uh, what else is a small business that we found out? And it's like due to the rules in America, yep. these are small businesses. Yeah. Whereas. You know, uh, you know, Nuns Barbecue, uh, you know, Uptown yeah. Barbecue. That's not a yeah. small business that's eligible for right. government funding. Right. You know, or right. their their application. Mm -hmm. And that's another question that I have. Um, are, are there ways uh, you may be a little bit more familiar with this uh, mm -hmm. block grants and HUD funding? and empowerment zones mm -hmm. are you more a little bit more familiar with what that looks like yeah, yeah. um and I, I don't really know i don't know actually how that's been implemented under this administration uh-huh yeah i don't um i know a lot of that stuff that originally some of it was being um through the city and through the dgc mm -hmm. um but I, I don't really know where those funds are are now um can you explain a little bit of what that is uh which one Let's go with uh, block grants. And well, first, let's go to what HUD is. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, HUD is the housing authority. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's for um, low income. Um, and I can't remember the actual the definition. Um, but, you know, that's that's th a lot of it. Actually, something that affects us as a people. And, and specifically, a lot of this kind of groundswell and the foundation of HUD has a whole lot to do with. Uh, what what began, as people know, with Eleanor Roosevelt coming to, uh, at the time, the Brewster Projects, the, yep. what became of the Brewster Projects. Yep. This is this was like a, a, a clarion moment in race relations in American history, as people know, yep. the foundation of what HUD became. Right. And HUD was, as we know, housing, urban development. Yep. Um, I, I'm, it, it's tough because it's another one of those things where urban is another term that's like yeah. loosely associated with black that's but not explicitly but, black exactly yeah yeah urban urban is that I, I hate that word urban actually um so whenever i see people with like over urban affairs and i mean that that basically that doesn't mean anything yeah i mean urban can be you know uh, it could be a white person i mean yeah. because now like the way with gentrification like it it's super broad and, you know, you have people I, I know um, in business, you know, there's a thing called hub zone where you can actually mm -hmm. have a business and you get like tax um, yes. abatements for being in areas that's considered like low income or distressed. And you have a lot of white folks that take advantage of that, um, and which originally it was created for African-Americans, um, you know, who lives in those areas, living and working. And so, you know. We've got to figure out a better way to to manage that and a better way to actually improve upon it because it's not really doing what it's supposed to do for our community. So when you think of the the black community and a black agenda, mm -hmm. because that's what you're speaking to. Yep. And I agree. And, and I, I when you even presented it to me, it's I'm still going on the assumption. It's like, damn, we live in an 85 percent black city, the most populated black city in America. Mm -hmm. You it's like. Technically, any agenda should be a black agenda for any politician. But no I can't go on that assumption because clearly that is not the case. It's not the case. Even for a black politician. And again, because if, if there's never a demand, there's no need. There, there won't ever be a need. And mm -hmm. so we've got to make it so that any person that's running for office, I don't care if you're black or white. Yes. That if you're not serving us in our best interests, then we're going to get you out of there. I don't care what your, your last name is. I don't care how cool you are with the community or, you know, how many other black leaders or pastors you put behind you. That don't that's that don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And we got we have to change the way we do that. Yes. So when we think of changing the way we do that, mm -hmm. and what that looks like. Yep. Um, what 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 is in that black agenda? What do you think 
that encompasses? I mean, I think definitely um, economic, uh, like r racial inequality. I mean, I it's all about economics for me. I feel like mm -hmm. economics and obviously politics, right? Uh, uh, political, being a political activism. But I think we have to be able to have access to capital. Mm -hmm. uh, we also need to have access to um, um, to to land mm -hmm. um, and to be able to create businesses for ourselves. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of programs that are still like doing predatory lending. They're still very you know, much so. And I mean, I would argue that. You know, people talk as if redlining is over, but I would argue redlining is more prevalent now. Oh, yeah. It's just under the guise of the school district. Yep. So, you know, there are uh, speckles of right. black people. But the, the concept is, you know, the more black students you have in this school, yep. <laughs> your property values start going down. Exactly. Which is another low key. You know, it's like inadvertent. Mm -hmm. red, like it's 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 like a, a slight hand trick you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying you got this all-white school district i bet you the property values are really high mm -hmm. property values are really high black people can't live there right the more black students you have in a school mm -hmm. will suppress the property value yep obviously black student mean black parent right right yeah i mean you're talking about insurance i mean it's all of these things i mean the, the i think the role of a government is to be able to create an environment Mm -hmm. for its community and its population to thrive and in detroit where the population is still majority african-american there's a problem when you go downtown and you don't see thriving black businesses that, or even black yeah. businesses period yeah i mean you know as they were saying that the the rioting the looting the the the, the chaos downtown and, and i drove down there that friday night and i'm looking around and i'm thinking to myself okay i see hot sam's and, and I love Tony and them. I mean, God knows if something would have happened, I wouldn't even been calling Tony and Lauren. I'd have been, I'd have been uh, definitely coming. Uh, I'd have been disobeying my my social distancing rules. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, Let's put yeah. it like that. Yeah, you know? yeah. But um, but it's, it's black businesses aren't downtown. You know, uh -huh. I, I think you have like kind of that corridor uh, in Paradise Valley of what uh, what. Uh, Hiram Jackson and Dennis Archer Jr. are looking to yeah. ignite right there. And that's yeah. like a like, what is that? Like two, three blocks. Yep. And even the black businesses now, I mean, those that are there, I mean, there's uh, I mean, there's and, and I don't I don't know if they want me to kind of tear yeah. their biz. But I mean, there are b businesses that were doing well, but just were not supported by their landlords. Yeah. I mean, clearly and, we, we've seen that happen time and time again I, I can't man my mind is slipping me but it was a classic that the restaurant that was at the corner down the street from um down the street from uh what was bucharest and i'm, I'm tripping and it was like um it was a good it was a good restaurant but uh -huh. you know things like this happen to us all the time and yep. i guess this is kind of becomes like what what is ownership and do we need to we need access to owner owning yeah, you like, talk capital. Yep. So like w with this access to capital, it's other things that keep us away from it. Yep. Starting with the application process alone. Yep. You know, the application process, uh, it, it's not culturally. It's just like, uh, you know, it's just like standardized testing. But right. in a right. in a business right. standpoint, no one black is creating this. Yep. And, and I think this is a good case of like when I talk about collective economics, I mean, you know, you have black businesses that are you have some restaurants that are you have some uh, black folks that have ownership in it, but not necessarily majority ownership. Yeah. And then you have folks that actually own the restaurant, but don't own the building. But what I'm what I'm saying is, like, how do we figure out like not how what we should be doing is figuring out how do we want first buy that building? Yeah. And then we make sure we intentionally make sure that that building is being rented at least to other African-Americans. And let's create our own. Like, you know, I'm not I'm ne I've never been in this whole idea of like handouts from the government. Now, yeah. I do think that the government owes us a lot because we built this country. Yeah. But we have to, you know, and I don't mean I don't want to sound preachy or anything like that. But, you know, I'm very intentional about the, the way I do my business. My business, what I, the kind of business I do is very intentional working with black businesses and particular local business. So my business in Flint, my business in Detroit, I'm making sure I'm working with Detroit, Detroit business, not real Detroit business, not those that just moved here just to get an address. Um, and, you know, even with the work that I'm doing in, in cannabis, like the whole purpose of me getting in cannabis is to make sure that we get more African-American investors involved because it's about to be 
to a place where there won't be any African Americans involved at all with cannabis because of how much a lot of the strenuous um, yeah. rules and regulations yep. that are parts of the other the 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 policies of systemic racism that continue right. to be perpetuated right where yeah. you know we look crazy because it's like okay as i'm black i can't get access to that yeah. it's like well that's how business is conducted and it's like well historically it never was designed for me to get so clearly i can't get to that yeah yeah i mean we created the culture of cannabis yes i mean we made it cool yeah you know, and, you know, years and years we've had people that have gone to jail for it. Right. Uh, and sure, now that it's legal, you have all of these people from all over that's coming in from California, from Canada, from mm. uh, Colorado. Yeah. And taking over these small mom and pop shops and not helping. And so for me, like one of the things that I'm doing with with the cannabis space is I told him, I said, not only want to be an investor because I want to have equity. And I want to be able to be have a seat at the table to make decisions. But I also want to be in a place where. I can bring in investors and I can actually be a part of. So I run our social equity program. Yeah. So I'm very intentional and thoughtful about making sure that folks that look like us are a part of the whole value stream, not just growing, not just an employee. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think a lot of cannabis companies like, oh, well, we hire black people. We, we, we hire people in the community. Nah, I want people to actually have their own businesses and you thrive and grow with us throughout the whole value chain. So if it's transportation, if it's through processing, if it's through events planning which we we work with tatiana grant and and her uh her company who's certified she was the first woman to be certified in the state of michigan like those are the things that are like real things we're working with craft growers where we're actually there's a gentleman who was a janitor at our office um that had a desire of wanting to have a transportation company mm -hmm. and he he actually drives his grandmother to get her met her uh her medicinal cannabis uh once a month Mm -hmm. And so he had this vision. He had this idea. He said, I don't have the money and I don't have the resources. So what we did was we actually paid for him to go through and get his chauffeur's license. Mm -hmm. So now he actually he passed his chauffeur's uh, test. He, we helped him to get finance to get him his first vehicle. So he's starting. He's not working with us. And this is a good example. This was actually one of our pilot projects where we took this. He's going to be doing our transportation. So uh, us transporting people like senior citizens to yeah. our facilities, but then also transporting and doing delivery services. So he own, that's that's the business that he owns. We don't own that. We just have a exclusive partnership with him yeah. and we helped him to get. That's the kind of stuff that I think that cannabis companies should be doing. They don't do it. What most cannabis companies are doing is writing checks to nonprofits and say, OK, we did our community work. We're done. Mm -hmm. um, but this is how you really empower people like you teach them to be fishermen, not to, yeah. you teach them how to fish. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing. And this gentleman uh, has changed his life. He used to be a janitor. Now he he has his own transportation company. Yeah. Um, so. And and from that lens of black empowerment, as you said, looking to Marcus Garvey and what he stood for. Um, I mean, coming up is the anniversary of the UNIA yeah. uh, it's foundation. So follow that information along with I know Juneteenth is coming up. And now I, I see some, like, I want to say Pennsylvania's making it a statewide holiday. And I'm sure some other states will as mm -hmm. well. Um, and this, this black independence and black empowerment, um, as you say, it's n not looking for a handout from the government, but politics and the government do play a role into ways we can function above ground. Yeah. And also just the, 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 the stress of what can be forced upon us, um, whether it be taxation, whether it be property ownership, right. I mean, just getting a business off the ground and started in the city of detroit um mm -hmm. i think i went to the ivy kitchen not too long ago and, mm -hmm. and just so much of what that family went through of just oh yeah you know uh you know uh, uh, being a black business in detroit you're gonna have to cross every t and dot every I. oh yeah oh yeah and then you got to deal with how do you rebound and pivot during COVID 19. and right? that's the uh, whole that's a whole nother, nother thing yeah heavy <clears throat> discussion as some of my favorite black owned restaurants they're not gonna be able to open that the 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 fees connected to i mean you you want to go uber eats but you know uber eats is charging me five dollars and they're charging them seven yep you know so you're like man do i want to pay twenty dollars for some chicken wings and in reality they're taking a loss yep. on those chicken wings for the one sh cook that they can bring in to make those chicken wings or whatever i'm choosing to buy the, right the, the quinoa salad or whatever like yep. so uh, and not to mention if these businesses uh, have developed a system in project planning and management mm -hmm. to be a carry out only business. Right. As many of our restaurants are sit down eateries. Exactly. Yep. 
yeah, it's it's a, it's a challenge, man. And um, you know, you know those kind of technical assistance is things that I feel like that's what the you know that's what government can be helping with is providing technical assistance for things like that. Because once you once it's time for them to open the doors, like. If they haven't had, like I said, having that process and system in place to be able to do carry out that wasn't designed to originally, that's a whole nother business model. It and is. if you can't afford to bring in a person, an expert that can actually help you develop that, yeah. then you're going out of business. And I, you know, I'm really afraid of what's going to happen when this time when the state opens back up, because a lot of businesses, I mean, you see big, medium and big size businesses basically filing bankruptcy. And we, I see that. Um, it was a, uh, and I'm probably sure you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to say La Culture, the owner of La Culture. Yeah. I don't even know him. He had yeah. a post on Instagram uh -huh. saying, man, these people don't want to work to get their money. Basically, as uh, carryout businesses were open back up, as you know, the, the $600 stimulus incentivizes now a person that's making more being unemployed right. than working. And yep. they don't want to commit unemployment fraud, yep. which is a very tough. That's that's a that's a. That's a rock in a hard place situation. Yeah. Because on one hand, your family may need that money. Yep. You know, and I understand where the business owner is coming from as well. Right. You know, challenges like that are, yeah. I mean, do you look at like government possibly assisting in something like that? Yeah. You know, I, I, this whole thing, I, I mean, I think it's something that I'm still processing because I think yeah. that we're, gonna, we're not going to really see the real, uh, the real impact until... Till later later this year and right? maybe i think maybe even two three years from now yeah on what it looks like yep uh, of what this is yep. as as all signs and science say that there will be a second wave of what this virus is yep and we just so, don't know when so in preparing in business mm -hmm. and, and and building the the supply chain for black businesses mm -hmm. um you know, as a community, how do we how do we collectivize? How do we come together? What are some of your ideas and theories? on Yeah. That? Well, I mean, it's obvious that we're going to have to really look at. I mean, when you think about education, education is going to be it's I mean, even if school starts for most people in the fall. Mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking it's going to be virtual school anyway. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a reduced year. It's not yes. they're going to be they're going to be they're going to close everything down, even colleges before Thanksgiving break. Yeah. So I think this is a good time as an entrepreneur, a business person, really think about all the things that's working right now. Right. Zoom. Yeah. You know, I've, Zoom's been around for a while. I never get I never time. use Zoom. I would get on a plane before I get on Zoom. And what we're finding is that we can actually do business from our homes. Like even the way that we look at real estate, a lot of these big office spaces, they don't necessarily need. They're finding they don't need that space. I was talking to a friend of mine who works for JP Morgan. He's like. I literally have been working from my home and we haven't missed a beat. He said, I've actually had the best quarter I've ever had. Hmm. I haven't. Been, he said, I, I don't print anything out at home. So, like, I don't necessarily need to have all of those printer costs. So all of their they're finding ways to, like, change their business and to make it lean mm -hmm. because people don't have to be in the office and they're not going to be in the office. They're going to be working on a 50 percent kind of like office capacity. So people will be rotating, you know, one week. Mm -hmm. It'll be 50 percent of the folks in the office so that you can have the social distancing. And then the next week, it'll be the other 50 percent. But the way that we look at it, the layout of having these big buildings downtown, like people are not going to need that. Yeah. All of that overhead, like it's for not. And, you know, we're going to have to really look at how we look at education, even healthcare. Like everything is going to be telemedicine. Mm. I mean, people have not missed a beat, um, you know, with their your therapists. Um, we're seeing your doctor because you can't go into their you couldn't go into like your doctor's office. Mm -hmm. So different technologies and different concepts and programs around that or around online learning from school standpoint, uh, inter engaging and active. That's for me as having children like that's my biggest challenge. I work full time for myself. I have three businesses. And the most challenging thing that first month was trying to balance being a homeschool my kids and still not drop the ball with my business so that I can still be able to pay bills and and yeah. and to you know do the things i need to do to keep my businesses running mm -hmm. um if there's a solution for that i'll be willing to pay for it i think um the solution is funny that's one of the discussions that i have coming up and uh being the president of the northwestern alumni association and that brings me back to another point that i want to bring up mm -hmm. uh it it looks as if it is going to be like a mixed mm -hmm. in class a lot of options are being looked at everything right. so like when you say uh the the thing unprecedented is in full effect right now yep. so creativity and options yep. all are being explored there is no 
man. That's Bad what I love idea right now. That's what I love, though. You know? I mean, this is like if you come out of this and you don't have a new business venture, or you haven't innovated or created something or haven't accomplished or been productive, then it's, then you just don't want to be mm -hmm. because we have more time than we've ever had before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I don't have any distractions. I don't have to get on an airplane. I don't have to be at a club or a restaurant having drinks with my boys. Mm -hmm. I'm literally at home all day. So when I'm done working, which mm -hmm. that never ends, but I have opportunities to do what I'm doing now. Like I spent most of my day writing my book. Yeah. You know, I'm working on a movie right now, actually yeah. a docu-series yeah. um, about Flint. And so I wouldn't have never had time to do that, nor would that have been a priority. But I have free time. I'm reading books that I want to read. Yeah. That's not related to work. And so um, there's a lot of stuff. A lot to me, there's going to be a lot. Of, I'm excited about what's going to what's going to take place in the next few months but this has all been because of these three months we've had off or i would say i uh, had off but but where we the, can the change in uh the way we live exactly and and with that I, I like i like that attitude but uh it looks like uh one of the options in in schooling will become and i'll advocate for it uh, mm -hmm. the most known one is mama shoe these uh the concept of the homework house and a homework oh. house is Technically, if you're listening, yeah. it's a it would be a center, even like my home. I may use the downstairs of this Detroit is different uh -huh. uh, space or maybe find other spaces where a master teacher and it may be even better to be outdoors because it's less chance outdoors. But a master teacher will sit with a group of students that just focuses on one particular subject. OK, you know, so if you're a student like technically they're saying like ninth and ninth and 11th grade will go on monday mm -hmm. and wednesday and 10th and 12th will go on tuesday and thursday and friday everybody's off so mm -hmm. if the student has that one day where they're quote unquote virtual learning yep you can look at this homework house and supplement some of our master teachers in our community mm -hmm. in another way oh wow, to okay. engage students more on a personal like one-on-one -on -one, you got this master teacher not in a tutorial capacity yep um but just making sure that this is a safe because you don't, you don't want anyone being neglectful of students and you don't want anyone that could harm students. But yep. someone that uh, can go a little bit more in depth with a, whatever that subject matter is. OK. And that is one of the options that I'm hearing a lot like about. That. I've been thinking it through. I'm like, that sounds like the natural direction that maybe even if people are considering homeschool would be something effective right. as well. So almost like a math camp or a geometry camp yeah, or yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, a martial arts camp or whatever yep. that may be mm -hmm. with these master teachers. And then that's also empowering the households of those teachers as well. Yep. No, I like that idea. You know, I think the sky is the limit. And, yeah. you know, because in times like this, I mean, this is this is where the multi this is where the billion dollar idea come out of yeah i mean because people are on i mean people are on internet um they're virtual with pretty much everything right now yeah and I like think i am tired of a zoom call like i'm telling you i'm on zoom literally all day long yeah and uh you know it's a point now where it's like i know how to manipulate it i not do a whole everything with it but i wish that i was like man i wish i had invested in zoom a long time ago i wish i would have yeah. you know even came up with the idea because it's it's a simple concept but Right now, that's the only way people are able to even do business, you know, that and team and uh, hang out and things like that. But and as <clears> you <throat> talk about that, um, when we think about some of these resources and policies and government, mm -hmm. you know, this local election that's coming up yep. with things being more virtual. Yep. How do you see do you see uh, what 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 type of accountability could could come into play as, you know, the land bank authority owns a lot of property here in, throughout yep. the city of Detroit. Mm -hmm. What's what's your opinion or what's some ideas you have on, you know, some of these properties, even in, on my own block, in my own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you know, city owns a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Uh, w what concepts do you have on, you know, on that? Yeah, I don't have any ideas specifically on that. Um, yeah. But I mean, I think I've all I'm always of the idea of buying land is never a bad investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't care. I mean, having land, owning land is always a good thing, um, even if it doesn't produce and yield something immediately. Um, but again, you come if you have a land, it's just a matter now of working with somebody who has a plan. And in particular, if it's in the opportunity zone, um, which, you know, there's not a lot of African-Americans that are taking advantage of that opportunity zone um, for a lot of different reasons. Either one, they have a program that is viable, but then and they don't have the funding or they have the funding, but don't have a program. 
Um, but there's a lot of people taking advantage of that opportunity zone. But yeah, man, buying land is never a bad thing. Technically, all of Detroit is an opportunity zone. Technically, yeah. As for the past two years, I personally, with my my creative differences marketing, have been looking at federal government contracting. Now that has been a task learning yeah. that mm -hmm. industry, which yep. maybe I'll sit and tell people how to at least get SAM certified and look through yep. those measures of what that looks like. Yep. But it's, it's a process. It is a process. And that's one of those things where, um, you know, I think that's that's what I did. So with my business, I've actually pivoted into the water business where we were uh, historically just doing bottled water for yeah. restaurants and hotels, which obviously yeah. for a while they've been closed. So we pivoted and now we actually are providing second line water solutions for federal government, state government, like municipalities and things like yeah. that. And that's one of those things where once you get involved and you get and when you're a once part you get of your first contract, as they always say, it's, you're in the mix. You're in the mix. But man. Getting that first contract can be. Exactly. And that's why making sure that you have the right kind of partners. Like I, I, I have partners that are already established in the government. So they provide, you know, when they, when they ask for like past performances, then I can actually mm -hmm. utilize and leverage my partners work. But like that's like one of those things that is recession proof. I remember last time there was a recession when I was as a working adult. Um, I was working for a defense company um, at that time. We were we had defense uh, contracts, so we never really felt the recession because the government that was paying us and all our contracts was coming through the government. We were getting paid. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the recession, we we never missed a beat. Yeah. They pay on time, and a lot of times it's net zero. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, and so to me, that's like one of those things where it's reoccurring revenue. It's 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 one that they pay their bills on time. Mm -hmm. um, unlike sometimes when you're dealing with vendors and things like that, they pay you when they can. Your clients, is, it's a dance. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a process. I, I would say to anybody interested in it, I may reveal it um, to you. And this kind of goes back to, as I say, the Northwestern alumni, you know, um, rest in peace, John Conyers. Mm -hmm. Rest in peace, Damon Keith. Rest in peace, Clyde Cleveland. It's some strong political figures that come from sure. uh, and walk with pride uh, identifying as civil rights activists. Sure. Um and as you talk about those leaders being in these positions and having the willingness to partner and, and, and see things together. Yeah. Um, some of it from sitting and interacting with those men and seeing them, I can say some of it would be the fact that, uh, especially for someone like John Conyers, um, it was revolutionary with what he did at one point in time just to show up just to know your pastor yeah just just existing just to shake your hand was mm -hmm. like a revolutionary act mm -hmm. in all his years of congress so much changed in our community yeah so much change in the tonality of america yeah that some of the things that he built a precedent for in building through this chaos it kept being deconstructed to be built up again deconstructed to be built up again deconstructed to be built up again so it's almost like a, a I, I i struggle sometimes with that like how do you expect a person that continues to do the same things they've always done yep to shift and be open to new approaches mm -hmm. when what they've always done was the more was their roadmap to success right and this is just on a person but now when you engage this as like a person in the black community mm -hmm. fighting for black empowerment, it's more layers. Because yep. even with your daughters, you know, technically the stuff that we think will be just yep. and balanced mm -hmm. and that's great. And we wish we would have had mm -hmm. should not be what they should settle for and say, no question. Yeah, This is great. Yep. So like I, I I struggle with that. Like, mm -hmm. what, do you have some some perspective on that? Even you know, with your talks with your parents. Yeah, I mean it's you know it's one of those things where I mean you know obviously my parents have come from a different generation. Yeah. Um, and I respect and I love. I mean, I, there's a lot of beauty and a lot of knowledge and wisdom that come from that. So I'm I'm a type of person I sit and listen, particularly yeah. like. You know, it's an African proverb. Not, I can't. I don't want to paraphrase it because um, I feel like I'm gonna murder it. But it's essentially, you know, um, a wise man is one, or a wise woman, or whoever is one that actually sit, sit underneath the elder um, and just listen. 
and you know having time to do that i mean whenever i find or whenever i have my mentors or people that have actually had lived experiences mm -hmm. um i spend a lot of time just listening and learning because history repeats itself and there's nothing new under the sun that whole concept of nothing new under the sun that's actually real True. um what we're experiencing today is what other people experience in just different levels yeah. and you know we we learn and we're able to be better and show up for our community in a better way when we actually take the time to make sure that we understand um, overstand what our ancestors and what our our elders have, you know, had had opportunity to go through and things like that. And then it's, it's, it's our responsibility to make sure that we pass that on and we, you know, lift as we climb, you know, as we continue to do what we're doing. Yeah. And, and it's unique, uh, as I'm sure you probably being an entrepreneur, I'm sure you love this movie um, last year. Um, Netflix, The Black Godfather. You watched oh, the, yeah, uh, yeah. the piece on yeah, Clarence Avant. Clarence Avant. Yeah. So Clarence Avon and his role with music, mm -hmm. film, uh, politics, uh, in, in that relationship. But yep. politically, it was a unique relationship mm -hmm. because his ties to the Clinton family and sticking with that Clinton family, Hillary Clinton, when mm -hmm. Barack Obama was running against mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton, yep. where his daughter said, no, I'm supporting Barack Obama. Yep. It was a... It was it, 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 in that in that documentary, it was almost like a an interesting, like witnessing this yeah. exchange right. of like his perspective being like, you know, I, uh, you know, the, the old phrase, I dance with who I came to the prom with. Yeah. Yep. And her daughter saying, no, nah, this is this is the time. This is a time right now where something can completely change. Yep. Yep between that generational yeah perspective yep you know yep and still respect yep but still a challenging discussion it is and having those challenging discussions i think need to happen yep. and that's why it was great to have this discussion with you man it's about a pleasure. like how to look at some things yeah where to look at some things and i look to you know continue this yeah uh, that black agenda discussion um, I, I want to know more about it. Detroit okay. is different. Welcomes that because uh, definitely Detroit needs a strong black agenda. Yep. Is this being one of the strongest black cities? Yep. You know, historically, yep. that's why the 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 highlight of uh, of uh, compromising the political interest of the city, I believe, has always existed. Yep. Um, so in close, uh, some of that economic power. I know you said we need to be thinking our own. Mm -hmm. What are some suggestions you have for that person? Because I, I do think that that lack of capital is very ever present with yep. some of the people I know with creative business ideas. Yep. You know, and banks just don't interact with our people. Yeah. You know, and what, I, are, what are some uh, suggestions you have for that person that's looking for for starting that business, mm -hmm. uh, but lacks lacks that capital to start? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think, you know, a couple of things. There's two there's actually two black owned uh, banks right now. Obviously, First Independence Bank is, is headquartered here in Detroit. Um, and then you have Liberty Bank, which mm -hmm. is I think they're headquartered in New Orleans, but they have a branch here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things with, you know, I, I'm, I always say we, we have to have accounts and do business with black black banks. But we also have to also hold them accountable because, you know, you have some black banks that will take your money, take your deposits, but it's not doing nothing in your community. So again, it goes back to, I don't care if you're black or white, like we definitely should be supporting because we should be putting our money in, in black banks. Um, and black, I mean, I mean, I did the PPP uh, uh, loan uh, through, through the first independence bank. And I, I you know, I first started to do it through JP Morgan, which was where my business banking was. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't actually make the cut because they had over 600,000 people to apply in one day or just the first round. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the process of going through first independence bank, I've been able to build relationship with from the CEO all the way down mm -hmm. and all of them look like me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of the things I was like, I need to do better about like, you know, and I've actually moved I'm like I moved my account, one of my accounts over there. And so I want to do more things to figure out how I can better engage and to get community involved, because, again, they they had they gave me that kind of banking experience that I didn't have at any of the banks. I've had I've credit unions and everything else, but I felt like this was my bank. Mm -hmm. 
And if we can figure out a way collectively, that's one of the things we're talking about around economic uh, economic agenda is like we find a bank that we're going to um, put our money in collectively. But they also got it. They have measuring. They have benchmarks that they have to do for us. We're not about to just get, put money in the bank because you're a black owned bank. You got to do stuff to black commute for the black community. And I do. I do know that the first independents have been very intentional about doing more for uh, African-American communities from lending, from uh, providing sponsorships and things like that. Different community engagement like other other banks. But I mean, I think that's one part is having that kind of banking relationship so that we can get loans, so that we can get access to capital so that we can actually create businesses, create ventures and to collaborate and things like that. So. Um, the, the economic agenda is something that's going to be very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, so we're looking at real estate. We're looking at a lot of different things. Um, and I know I've been talking with Ken Harris, you know, you know, yeah, Ken I, Harris. I'm going to have him on this series soon, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. So we, we're, we're actually in the process of pulling together a group of folks. We want to kind of put together a framework so that we can have a productive conversation. So that's going to be coming real soon. And I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, it's, it's unique that you speak to that. Uh, mm -hmm. When I talk to Ken, I definitely will have that. Uh, economist point of view uh, and he also reintroduced me to like one of his closest friends uh blanks uh ken blanks so yeah i have blanks yeah, on yeah. too okay I don't know if you know blanks but i know uh, of yeah 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 so uh we'll be talking about investment as uh that's one of the things he looks at as well okay um because i do think that there are there are some things to think about being a uh being more of my work is is around this idea of getting the word out from the community for Detroit is different and creative differences funds what I do with D Detroit is different Got it. but uh, but it's still engaging in business and, yep. and knowing that that resource matters too yep. and perception really matters too and that's why I'm so glad that you were able to come on again and yeah. uh, another great discussion we'll pick this up and, and next time we pick this up it'll probably be closer to I'm guessing sometime in the fall, okay. we'll be talking about where that agenda stands mm -hmm. and having some points of what what to look at. Sure. Because in that agenda, I would like to expand that agenda when I talk to Blanks, even about some of these corporations. When we look at like a, a possible, as he said, it like almost like a hood mutual fund ish, or like uh, collectivizing our money yeah. around corporations that choose to meet certain standards more so I like than that. just. Uh, black ceo meaning like this is how you're going to enact because yep. we're seeing right now so many corporations say i'm putting this up for racial equality i'm putting this up for racial equity but it's like what organization are you giving this to and then what what does that even mean yep you know yep. uh like what I, I didn't even know it was a racial equity organization out there yeah, you know what yeah. i'm saying yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And who's who what what's the checks and balances on that exactly you know yeah. what i'm saying is is it some form that people are filling out and mm -hmm. then we want to know who were the determinants on these forms right. that are being made, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, as an avid reader, uh, what, what are some things that you think, uh, you've definitely taught Claude Anderson before, but what are some other things that you think that people can walk away and learning more about this perspective? As uh, you said, internationally, people are calling you. Uh, I've definitely have like, a lot of white homies, they've reached out. I, mm -hmm. I welcome the discussion because I do think you don't learn unless you really talk to people. Mm -hmm. But uh, what are some books? What are some uh, what are some documentaries? What are what's some mm -hmm. culture that people can take in to get some perspective on this? Man, I, I, I say this, man. read everything. Dr. Claude Anderson, everything. Okay. Dr. Claude Anderson, he's like one of those people who like he makes it very plain. Yep. Um, and it's very relevant and stuff. I mean, he has books that he's written 10, 20 years ago and it's still relevant today. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm really big in a lot of some of these podcasts. Um, Earn Your Leisure. I've I watched them a lot. One of my homegirls has a black black startup. It's a black startup week or I can't remember. Uh, but Kezia Williams. OK. Um, she has a lot of great content. OK. Um, uh, let's see. Let's say Earn Your Leisure. Um, great content. Uh, my boy Ash Cash on uh, he has his own podcast and he's on Instagram. He okay. has a lot of a lot of good things around um financial investing um empowerment and things like that um he even kind of like helps with like writing your own first book mm -hmm. um yeah i mean that's those are those are some of the folks that i like i really pay close attention to there's another brother named um uh, his name just slipped me uh but he's a vc guy so he helps p he helps and i can't remember his name uh so yeah, his name just slipped slipped my slipped my mind but um mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Claude Anderson is is, I mean, that's the that's the start. So that's the definitely start. Definitely know. Um, 
Dirty Little Secrets, yep. Black Labor, White Wealth, Power Powernomics. Yeah. Um, yeah, he he was uh, he is one of the foremost thinkers when we think of what uh, economics and political theory looks like yep. in America yep. from the black agenda. Yep. So I, I do think that if if you need to read something and you suggested this last time. Yeah. Grab those books. Yeah, man. Grab those books. Yeah. If you don't feel like reading, I mean, right now he does put out content on his own YouTube he does. channel. Yep. Go to his YouTube channel. Yep. Get it direct. Yep. Get it plain. Get it straight from, uh, as they say, the horse's mouth. Yeah, definitely. So uh, thank you so much again, Jonathan. Man, it's my pleasure. And uh, in, in the fall, I'm going to bring you back. Okay. All right. Peace. Cool. All right. Detroit is Different is where you get information, artistry, history, music, and even comedy. Detroit is Different, a home for the culture of Detroit. Visit online at DetroitIsDifferent.com today.